Tonight, live, the 46th Annual Academy Award Presentation. It's no surprise that Mean Streets was not mentioned at the Oscars. However, The Exorcist got 10 nominations, including Best Supporting Actress. You know what she did? <laughs> Your canting daughter? <laughs> and though fate did not smile on Ellen Burstyn that evening, Warner wanted to make another film with her. The actress wanted to do the movie based on Robert Getchell's screenplay, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. The studio agreed and suggested that she choose the director herself. First, Ellen went to Coppola, who recommended that she watch Mean Streets. Burstyn was attracted to the realism and agreed to meet with Martin, who, being a nervous person by nature, could barely contain himself when he found out. For him, the meeting would not only mean getting to meet Ellen, but possibly the first studio movie in his career. The actress was worried that the director had rarely given attention to female characters. And I can't tell from that movie if you know anything about women at all, do you? And he said, no, but I'd like to learn. So I thought that was as good an answer as I could ever imagine. And the project ensued. Ta -da! To get in the right frame of mind, the director surrounded himself with ladies. His producer became his girlfriend Sandy Weintraub. Bob Raffleson's wife, Toby Raffleson, agreed to be the production designer, and George Lucas's wife, Marsha, became the editing director. Marty called and asked if I would do his first studio feature. He was terrified of the studio executives that Warner was going to give him some old fuddy-duddy editor or a spy. The studios were known for having spies on projects. Marty liked to edit, and I felt like I was being hired to cut a movie so I wouldn't cut it. So I'd let the director cut it. But I thought, if I'm ever going to get any real credit, I'm going to have to cut a movie for someone besides George, because if I'm cutting for my husband, they're going to think George let his wife play around in the cutting room. That's how Martin ended up with an excellent team, a $2 million budget, and a chance to prove himself from the studio. That was it. I uh, did it. I got a job as a singer. <laughs> Are we rich? Well, no, we're not rich yet, but we might be someday. Oh. Two weeks before filming started, the director had found all the actors. Besides Burstyn, there was Harvey Keitel, Hiya. Hiya. Chris Christopherson, and a young Jodie Foster. So long, suckers! Go on, Rip. Half-improvised rehearsals became Scorsese's habit when preparing for Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. The actor had complete freedom, and each successful line or reaction was immediately added to the script. Martin would go on to use this method in all of his following films. How did I get such a smart-ass kid? He got pregnant. The budget and support of a studio often fill directors with confidence, but also make them wary of the cost of failure. Scorsese worried a lot and exhausted the actors and film crew by doing dozens of takes. The extent of his eccentricity was exposed while filming at the ranch. The team had rented a farm, having paid the owners to take a week off. After seven days, the owners returned, but when they opened the front door, Martin was still sweating over the finale. I know what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm doing. As soon as Burstyn had said her final line, the director insisted they repeat the take. Two hours later, the owners started to hurry the director. Their irritation grew and they started to comment on everything, making fun of the actors and tease the director about his lack of talent. Scorsese remembers this episode like a nightmare, because in front of his colleagues he was being belittled by a pair of farmers. But it was a learning experience, and still, Martin didn't give up and did not leave the house until he had gotten the results that he wanted. Aren't you gonna open the door for me? De Niro would often visit him on set. The actor wasn't just visiting his friends, they would talk about future projects. The director talked about making The Last Temptation of Christ, while Robert insisted on a biography about Jake LaMotta. A month later, their arguments moved from the set to the editing room. While Marsha Lucas was editing frames, Scorsese fought with the studio. The first casualty was the scene meant to be an homage to The Wizard of Oz. To prove that I love you, I swear I don't know how. Warner demanded that Martin's favorite moment be cut. All this after the first time in his career he was allowed to design his own set decorations created by the legendary Citizen Kane production designer, Daryl Silvera. The set alone cost $80,000. Only the threat that Martin would publicly rescind his participation in the film saved the scene. Sadly, it was the prologue that got the most negativity from critics. The war with Burstyn exhausted him too. Though Ellen was only the lead actress, she was also like one of the producers. Warner had basically created the project for her. 
The actress was involved in all of the stages of the work, whether Scorsese wanted her there or not. You're annoying me! When he forbade Burstyn from setting foot in the editing room, their relationship collapsed. It was the price the director had to pay to retain control over the film. Angry, but not broken, he won the final battle. The screenplay's finale was a typical happily ever after. The couple walks into the sunset and the credits roll up the screen. Scorsese felt this was false and in a fit of rage tore the film. The studio had to reshoot the finale. The director knew that he would not be able to split the main characters and get his realistic ending. So he found a compromise. The finale followed the screenplay in everything except the scene with the sunset. However, the theatrical and fictitious moment at the diner with the absurd applause was his way of turning it into satire. That's how he got the illusionary happy ending, but basically wrote in their breakup in between the lines. Before showing Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore to the studio, Martin went to New York and made a film for himself. It was a documentary interview where he talked to his parents about life as Italians in New York and the life of his ancestors in Sicily. She came over, she said she almost died on a trip there. The boats were, were small, were very small, but they came, it took her a month and a half, a month, over a month to get away by boat. It was a month until the premiere, but the director was no longer worried about the success of the film. Mean Streets had made him a reputation in Hollywood. There were dozens of producers and screenwriters dying to work with him, but he was aiming for Paul Schrader. Schrader had been trying to sell the rights to Taxi Driver for over a year and had already turned Scorsese down. Paul had been trying to get Brian De Palma and Steven Spielberg, but their tight schedules and tiny budgets made them turn the project down. Then Schrader watched Mean Streets, changed his mind, and convinced Columbia Pictures to give Martin a chance. The only condition was that the main role would go to Robert De Niro. Scorsese had been dreaming that Travis Bickle would be played by Harvey Keitel, and though at first he prickled at the condition, his desire to make the film was stronger than his pride. On the 9th of December 1974, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore premiered with surprising success. The picture garnered over $20 million and got three Oscar nominations. Ellen Burstyn had her revenge and won the award for Best Actress. Ellen is in a play tonight in New York. She can't be here. She asked me to uh, thank everyone concerned with the uh, voting, the Academy who voted for her, also the entire cast and crew of Alice, and she also asked me to thank myself. <laughs> thank you. That year, the second installment of The Godfather triumphed at the ceremony, and De Niro got an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. For Martin, whose presence the Academy had yet to acknowledge, this was bad news. He rejoiced for his friend's success, but in the contract for Taxi Driver, Robert was to be paid $35,000. However, he hadn't yet signed. After his victory, he could easily ask for 10 times more, which would have been a justified price for an Oscar winner. The budget did not allow for such luxuries, which would have meant that Martin did not hold up his side of the bargain. But despite opposing advice from his agent, the actor stuck to his first agreement and saved Taxi Driver. Here's a man who would not take it anymore. A man who stood up against the scum, the cunts, the dogs, the filth, the shit. Here is someone who stood up. In the spring of 75, Scorsese says he was getting ready to film and De Niro went to Italy, where he was filming Bertolucci's 1900. Imagine the look on my father's face if he knew we were here together. Oof. In between filming, he would return to the U.S. and research for his role. He interviewed veterans at the Army bases and worked as a taxi driver in New York for two weeks, and then went to Schrader and raided his wardrobe. All of Travis's clothing belonged to his creator. <laughs> Meanwhile, Martin was gathering an all-star team. In the script, the leading lady, Betsy, was described as a woman who looked like Sybil Shepard. No one resembling Sybil had tried out, but one day Shepard's agent called Martin and asked, I hear you're looking for a Sybil Shepard type. Why don't you hire Sybil? And Scorsese answered, we can't afford her. However, the actress had only been acting in Peter Bogdanovich's comedies and wanted to explore other facets of her talent so badly that she agreed to a minimal salary. Appreciate this, Betsy. Oh, how De Niro would hate her on set. Jibes and barbs would give way to accusation of bad acting. The couple would grow to hate each other and never acted together again. Jodie Foster, on the other hand, Robert considered the diamond in the rough. 
though her character and her casting was the subject of heated argument. So what makes you so high and mighty? Will you tell me that? But no. It goes without saying that the talented actress succeeded, though she had only turned 12 during shooting. Wanna make it like this? Before reading the script, Jody took a series of psychological tests. Then she saw a psychiatrist every week. The doctor made sure that the rehearsals and shooting schedule were not adversely affecting her. She was walked through every violent scene by the special effects director who showed her that it was all an illusion. However, in the final violent scenes, she was forbidden to participate. A few of the scenes were deleted from the screenplay, and in the others, the actress was replaced by her older sister. By the way, Jodie had help from the very girl based on whom Schrader had written the character. Garth Avery even played Iris's friend in the film. You looking for some action? Yeah. Martin offered the campaign manager role to Harvey Keitel, but the actor preferred to play the pimp on screen. How's everything in the pimp business, huh? Do I know you? No. And even though the role was supposed to be a black character with three lines, Scorsese agreed and rewrote the text to give Harvey some more screen time. I swear I'm clean. I'm just waiting here for a friend. You gonna bust me for nothing, man? In the summer of 75, the beaches of the U.S. emptied thanks to the release of Jaws. But the real terror was on the streets of New York. All the animals come out at night. Whores, skunk pussies, buggers, queens, fairies, dopers, junkies. Michael Chapman's lens captured hundreds of sweaty people, tons of garbage and sewage, which was not part of the author's vision, nor the production designer's idea, but rather a garbage worker strike. The strike lasted a few days, but because of the unusual heat, journalists would dub that July to be the worst in the history of the city. If the camera could have captured smells, then Taxi Driver would have been the stinkiest film ever. But even without that factor, Chapman was able to capture the atmosphere completely. Whatever it is, he should clean up this city here, because this city here is like an open sewer, you know? It's full of filth and scum. Travis? Travis. cinematographer first captured Scorsese's attention with his work in The Last Detail. Plus, his style reminded him of Godard. Michael even filmed the cup with the bubbling Alka-Seltzer in a direct allusion to the drama Two or Three Things I Know About Her. Chapman's main job was to depict the world through Bickle's eyes without drawing attention to him. During the talk with Betsy, the camera pans out from Travis and focuses on the dark street outside. Martin believes this is one of the most important scenes in the film because it's very painful to look at Travis, and the empty hallway is like his inner world. I tried several times to call her, but after the first call, she wouldn't come to the phone any longer. For the scene where they buy weapons, Sandy Weintraub invited a friend who brought his personal arsenal to the set and played the role of the gun salesman. The idea of filming the guns as though they were religious icons was masterfully executed by Chapman. However, the moment where Travis aims at the window is Robert's improvisation. Not the whole scene, but the finale where the gun is drawn to the random passerby who happens to be in the frame. After filming that scene, the director befriended Stephen Prince, who became his weapon supplier for his pictures and sometimes played the role of a bodyguard or even butler. Later, when Martin's drug addiction escalated, Stephen was one of the only people who could calm the director down. I know, I know you must think that I'm, you know, <laughs> You must think I'm pretty sick or something. You know, you must think I'm pretty sick. The cocaine and the resulting paranoia led to a breakup with Sandy. But Martin did not stay lonely long and started dating Julia Cameron, who was a journalist writing an article about Taxi Driver during filming. Six months after they met, they were married. But let's get back to the set. The number of improvisations was irritating to Paul Schrader, though Scorsese insisted that they continue to exist. De Niro's famous phrase is also an improvisation. You talking to me? Well, then who the hell else are you talking? You talking to me? The director thought that Bob had been inspired by the scene with Marlon Brando from Reflections in a Golden Eye, but the actor was imitating Bruce Springsteen, who used to warm up the crowds at his concert with similar phrases. 
Travis's order at the dinner is an allusion to the serial killer at Gein. I had black coffee and apple pie with a slice of melted yellow cheese. He asked for apple pie with melted cheese in exchange for a confession. By the way, Ed was the prototype for Norman Bates, one of cinema's most famous maniacs. Let them see what kind of a person I am. And of course, the music. Martin tried to convince Bernard Herrmann to do the soundtrack, the same person who composed the music for Citizen Kane. But the composer declined, thinking that the film was going to be about car racing. However, after he read the script, he changed his mind. After the orchestra had finished recording, Scorsese called Bernard and asked him to add one more detail. The only long and scary chord. And even though it meant paying the orchestra another whole day, the composer agreed. Soon after that session, the maestro died, leaving behind him one of the greatest works of his career. The final fight scene was the hardest. De Niro recalled besides technical problems, humor got in the way and would derail the serious mood for hours. They weren't laughing because they found violence funny, but because they were anxious and a little frightened. But nobody was more anxious than Scorsese. The Motion Picture Association of America was on his case about the film's rating and wanted to rate it X for mature viewers only. <sighs> Movies like that are not released in commercial theaters, and grindhouse showings would not earn enough to break even. So the rating would have killed all chances of commercial success. Cabby, just forget about this, it's nothing. The head of Columbia Pictures predictably suggested that they cut out the scene completely, as well as one with the Alka-Seltzer which he called an inappropriate advertisement of anti-hangover meds. This evaluation infuriated Martin, and he shut himself in to the editing room. Just him, the film, a bottle of Don Perignon, and a mound of cocaine. When he was just about to give up, he invited three of his friends to help, Brian De Palma, John Milius, and Steven Spielberg. I'd never seen Marty so upset, verging on tears, but leaning towards rage. He shattered a glass of Sparklet's bottle all over the kitchen floor. We were holding his arms, trying to calm him down, find out why he was so upset. He finally came out with the fact that Columbia had seen his movie and hated the ending, and wanted him to take out all of the violence, the entire shootout, to cut away from the splintering fingers and the blood spouting and puddling. They felt the film was bound for an X rating, and he was being forced to Disneyize it. Fuck out of here, man. Get out of here. His friends tried to pacify him, but he was already on the warpath. First, they took the picture to some New York critics and then got some studio bashing reviews ready. Then the company United Artists contracted him and offered to buy the distribution rights and release the movie without any changes. In the end, Columbia compromised and Martin was able to cut out only a few of the most violent frames and soften the tone of the picture, making the scene almost colorless, which actually worked in its favor. The MPA took pity and gave the film an R rating. On the 8th of February, 1976, Taxi Driver premiered. At noon on Manhattan, at the Cinema One Theater, the doors opened to a mob of young people who looked exactly like Travis and who had been standing in line for two to three hours to see the film. Jodie Foster was denied entry without her parents. During the first weekend, the film made 60,000 in New York alone. Overall, it made 24 million. Four months later, the picture received a Palme d'Or at Cannes. A year later, it was nominated for four Oscars for Best Film, Actor, Actress, and Soundtrack. But the victor in 77 was Rocky, while Taxi Driver did not receive a single statuette. Critics were divided into two camps. The first was obsessed with the picture and dubbed Scorsese a genius, while the other camp was disturbed by the violence and political subtext. The film was seriously accused of propagating violence despite the fact that only four people die over the course of the film. But it did have a negative impact. Six years later, the reel inspired John Hinckley Jr. to attempt killing Ronald Reagan. Before he wounded the President of the United States, John stalked Jodie Foster at Yale University and wrote her a letter, where he promised to impress her with a certain deed. I felt very shocked, very frightened and um, very distressed. 
After being arrested, Hinckley spent 36 years in a psych ward and was discharged on the 10th of December, 2016. Hey, do you like our work? Let us know with your like and comment. Push that subscribe button and share with your friends. If you want to support the project financially, become our sponsor on Patreon or YouTube sponsorship. Thank you.